Fantastic. Perfect. That's a good way to start. Okay. I'm going to jump in. I know we only have 30 minutes and I want to get rolling. So uh, my name is Audrey Crane. I work at a company called Design Map. We're based in San Francisco. We've been around for 15 years, almost 16. Uh, we're really focused on designing digital products for complex um, situations. So it's often B2B, uh, pretty much always SaaS or mobile, uh, sometimes B2B to C in places like healthcare and finance, where again, the, the complexity level is high. Uh, oops, sorry. And so I'm one of four partners actually. And I, as I was getting ready to talk at this conference, I was a little bit nervous. Uh, I felt like I needed to establish some credibility since I'm a designer and not a, an engineer or a product manager. So very briefly, I uh, feel like this is the only <laughs> slide I need to establish credibility. I wrote my first computer program when I was five on a Radio Shack TRS-80, or as they were affectionately known, a Trash-80. Um, and I studied theater and math in college. So I loved non-Euclidean geometry. In fact, my favorite postulate is Euclid's fifth. And I worked at Netscape from uh, in the late 90s, so about 1995 to 1999. I worked directly for Marty Kagan, or the great wise one, as uh, Christian Idioti calls him. Um, and then some lesser known, but just as, as great and wise ones, uh, Hugh Deverly is a it, um, a great mind in the design space. Uh, I also got to be in the room when Ben Horowitz rolled out his good product manager's documents um, and uh, lots of other amazing people. And I also wrote this short book uh, on how to help senior executives understand what design is and why it matters and how to use it to build a more successful business. So since then, I've worked inside companies, running design teams. I've freelanced and consulted for some pretty amazing clients. So hopefully, evidently, many with blue logos. So hopefully that establishes me as credible. And today I'm a partner at Design Map. Um, and specifically, one of the things I've been doing recently is, is coaching some leaders and working with product teams who are struggling honestly, almost having like an existential struggle. Like, what is their job? Why are they there? Are they, are they serving the business? Are they serving customers? Is it even clear what they mean by customer? Should they ask the customer? Should they just do what they're told by their, their stakeholders? But I've seen some of the folks that I'm working with successfully begin the shift from being feature teams to being product teams. And so today I like to share some of those strategies with you. So to start with, um, just kind of briefly level set on terms. I, I'm sure everybody here knows these terms, feature team and product team, but I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page before I get into the techniques. So um, borrowing directly from Marty Kagan's books, which I'll, I'll do quite liberally throughout this talk, um, where a features team purpose is to deliver features, right? That's the moniker feature team. An empowered product team's purpose is to solve problems uh, in ways that customers love, but that also work directly for a business. Or another way to look at them, a features team uh, knowledge of the customer is kind of minimal, right? There's just the hope that if the business says they need to build such feature that there's someone out there that will actually find that usable and valuable. Whereas an empowered product team has deep knowledge of the customer and the responsibilities are very different. And the feature team side, it's prioritized features by certain dates on the product. Empowered product team though, they're producing desirable outcomes. A different way to look at it is we could say um, for, if a problem has more than one potential solution and more than one potential way to, to implement uh, that solution, empowered product teams are given problems to solve, right? Whereas feature teams are given solutions to implement. So that model will come back later and it's um, helpful, I think, to frame it up this way. But interestingly, the compositions of the teams are very similar. So uh, you'll have a product manager, an engineer, and a designer. On a feature team, maybe you have like a fraction of a designer or nominally a designer, but generally, I think it's pretty well established that on all, all three of those disciplines exist, regardless of which type of team you live in. 
So today I'm going to talk about how you can leverage the fact that you might have one there. So uh, borrowing um, design methodologies and just using the fact that you have designers there to move from being feature teams to being empowered product teams. And I'm going to talk about approaching it very briefly in three different ways. So one is kind of a bottom-up approach, another is a top-down approach, and then the third is kind of an outside-in approach. So the first one is bottom-up. It's creating value where you are, in, or uh, the subtitle, not don't try to boil the ocean. So this is really about like where those feature requests happen, really where the rubber meets the road. So the experience of getting a list like this, um, like a prioritized list of features is probably familiar to most of the people at this conference. It's, it's not a great experience. Um, and, and I think the reason it's not a great experience is because you have all this knowledge and experience and training and smarts and you're capable of doing all kinds of things but when you get a list of prioritized features what you're being asked to do is almost like taking an order you know it's a really tiny subset of what you're capable of um and what's interesting as we started to think about this is that we don't think this is really um specific to product managers all kinds of people get this like order request that's a tiny subset of what they're capable of. Um, I'm going to play you a video uh, and it's a, a video of a it's a little video clip of a TV show that was on a few years ago about a Broadway production and I'll try I'll turn my volume way up so hopefully you can hear me okay or hear the video okay so just to set it up a little bit there's a, a new director he's not very experienced as a director and he's talking to his leading lady about how to perform this role that she's in, which happens to be Marilyn Monroe. So I'll go to the next slide and hopefully the audio will work out. Never mind. So I don't know if everyone caught the last little exchange between the chorus members there, but he said, um, did he just give her a line reading? And for the, I know not all of you are, are, are English as a first language and not all of you have a theater background. So I'll just explain briefly that this idea of a line reading is a, is forbidden, absolutely forbidden in the theater. And theater is a really old profession, right? It's that many thousands of years old. And in any even high school, middle school, kindergarten production, the director doesn't tell the actor how to say the line because the implication is the best thing that you can do is just pretend that you're me. <laughs> and all of your training, all of your uh, experience, all of your ideas about how to do this, they don't really matter. Just like take this order. Um, it happens to designers as well. So you get a, designers get wireframes or sketches or drawings on whiteboards and ask just to like make it look good. Um, teachers, it happens to teachers as well. Uh, here in the States, they might get a, a really detailed lesson plan handed to them. And again, like what you know about these kids, your training and experience, doesn't matter. Just do what you're told. Do this like tiny subset of what you're capable of. This is actually a letter to Santa. Um, <laughs> and it's another kind of a, kind of a, uh, an order, right? Instead of me being able to come up with what might be best for my kids, I'm just told like, okay, well, just don't go do this. We don't need your understanding or ideas or anything other than your ability to take an order. And it, it kind of feels like this, right? It feels like working in a restaurant, asking people what they like for dinner. But to quote Marty, we're trying to move away. All, we all, the empowered product team is trying to move away from a, what he calls a subservient model to a collaborative model. So how can we turn a, a service touch point into a moment of collaboration? 
So we have some ways of approaching this because as consultants, we have this happen all the time and, and my coaching clients do as well. And we think this is a moment where you can really deploy design thinking. This is a model of design thinking that happens to be Stanford's. There are several, I'm kind of agnostic. Um, but in any case, whichever design thinking model we're using, we're talking about applying it not to your product, like designing your product, but applying it to the process of designing a product. So designing moments of collaboration and treating people who are putting in, submitting these feature requests, your stakeholders, treating them like customers. So the first step is to empathize. Why are they giving you these feature lists? What's the root of that request? Um, empathizing with them and, and getting curious and understanding like, did their boss give them this? Is it is this what they think it's supposed to work like? Um, how did they learn that? Did they have a success or a failure working like that in the past? Also understanding what their personal success hinges on and even getting to things outside of work. Like, do they have kids? What are their hobbies? What are their interests? This part of it is building a human relationship and really building trust, which Marty talks about a little bit as well. And once we've empathized with them, then we can create a, a validated problem statement based on why this is happening. Um, so what, why are we getting these feature requests? Is it because this it's always worked well in the past or we tried something different in the past and it didn't work? Maybe it's something about um, contracts are getting signed by the sales team and the person putting in these feature requests really couldn't do anything about it. Or maybe they just don't know what you're capable of. But once we've empathized and we've kind of defined a problem statement, then we can use the old design trick of how might we address that problem statement. And some prompts for this are, you know, how might you address it if you were outside of your company, if you were a consultant? What's the smallest, least expensive thing that you could try? Um, what would it look like if you wanted to make this person giving you the feature list look like a hero? What would you do differently? So after coming up with some ideas and picking one, then it's, you know, it's a question of prototyping and testing and of course, iterating it. So trying it out once or twice with one or two people, making adjustments and um, then trying again. So some of the strategies that I've seen work for this kind of prototype and test step are story mapping out all the features and looking for understanding and also overlaps and gaps and really engaging with the with the feature requester um, and also helping them understand what you're capable of. You could employ a design sprint at this point. If the problem really is contracts are getting signed without any input, like maybe you can go meet with the sales team and figure out how to support them so that they can win their sale, but you are, are um, solving for outcomes and not features. Um, I like the technique I heard you say. And so even just playing back what you heard um, can be really helpful. So I guess I would warn, and it's probably obvious from my description that this is a long game, right? You're not just gonna do it once and then everything is gonna be different. It's you're gonna iterate and try and try, but you're changing not a product, but a process. And so it's these like little nudges and attempts that can start to move the ship uh, in a different direction. So that's bottom up. That's kind of the longest one to describe, but we're gonna get into um, the next two. But this is the looking for designing moments of collaboration where service is implied or expected. Now I said, don't try to boil the ocean. And now I'm gonna say the opposite of that. I'm gonna say, go ahead and try to boil the ocean. So here, what I'm proposing is using design as a Trojan horse for the whole product team to become an empowered product team. And specifically what I'm talking about is there's executives are getting the news that design helps drive revenue. And in lots of companies, you're getting some airtime, but executives don't know how to support design. They don't know where to start, but they're seeing these reports from companies like Forrester and McKinsey and Gartner that tell them their business can be more successful if they figure that out. Um, 
that that's why this little book exists actually. <laughs> um, now it's not that designers aren't good at talking about the ROI of design too, but I think that you, that product managers and engineers specifically can help them because it's not designers talking about how important they are. And, and designers tend to talk to designers about design. They're not Forgive me for the designers out there, but I, I think most people would agree that they're not great at talking to other disciplines about design and why it matters. So product managers in particular, I think are, are especially well suited to help um, talk to the organization about the value of design because they know the language. They know what parts of the strategy resonate. They know who to talk to in the organization. So specifically what I'm talking about, especially again for product managers, is helping your design leader build a deck like this and talk to management and executives about how and why to leverage design. Um, you can help them tell the business story. Your input on the deck is gonna help make it resonate or whatever your format of information sharing is in your organization. It's gonna help it resonate and stick um, more with the business audience. And you can help build the audience too. Uh, I have one client who put together a deck like this. She shared it with her boss. He was like, this is pretty great. I learned a lot. Like, why don't you share it with my boss as well? So she shared it with her boss's boss. He said the same thing. Then she shared it with his peers. And she actually just about a month ago shared it with the CEO of the, of the bank that she's working on. So a pretty big organization. So kind of doing a roadshow when everybody was interested and learned how they could help support design with the goal of supporting their business and ultimately their customers. And the reason I'm suggesting that you make this big investment in helping your designer go in this red show is because design wants what you want, right? They wanna to talk to customers first, not last. They wanna understand the real problems. They want all the things that empowered product teams have, creative flexibility, knowing that they have a real impact and, and being able to work not on tickets or orders or feature lists. Um, and really what we're doing here is by evangelizing for design, you're evangelizing for empowered product teams where design becomes a Trojan horse essentially. And that advances the whole team. I'm very proud of that animation. <laughs> and my little joke, like it's Trojan, not Trajan, which is a font. Um, anyway, I'm sure I'm the only person laughing at that. So we've got the bottom up approach, we've got the top down approach, and now we want to talk about the outside in approach. And so this is the third method, the idea that usability testing is never just usability testing, or I'm thinking of it as like operation customer hug. I looked for images of like bear hugging a person, and there are a lot, but they're all creepy. So we're just gonna go with bears hugging bears. So first of all, I just wanna acknowledge that there are still some companies out there where feature teams can't talk to customers. Hopefully you're all gasping and shocked, but it, believe me, we, we know some of them. It's rare, but it still happens. And sometimes it's like an organizational issue where some other part of the org owns customer conversations that might be like a customer insight team or even an innovation team customer success or sales, or um, maybe there's just a separate research team. And also sometimes in B2B, customer is not a customer. Like the user isn't thought of as a customer. It's the reseller, the OEM. So you only talk to, to buyers or resellers or things like that. So that might as well be nothing. Like if, if the product team can't talk, to actual customers, then it's like, we might as well just be playing pinball. Um, so by definition, hopefully we're all in agreement that it's impossible to be a product team without regular customer contact. But even in cases where the team can talk to customers, the conversations may be limited. And, and this could be like a self-limitation or an external expectation. But in any event, it's, it's a limitation to conducting usability studies. Um, but if you're only doing usability studies, then you're only talking about the implementation details, right? So we talked about implementation in this model that we looked at before. A customer problem has more than one potential solution, right? 
and more than way, one potential way to implement that solution. So where empowered product teams receive a problem and they have the opportunity to identify the best solution as well as the best implementation, feature teams just receive that solution. That's what that feature, that order is, right? And hopefully they have the opportunity to identify the best implementation. Um, presumably the solution is to a problem that actually exists and it is a good solution. Um, but what I'm suggesting is actually going beyond testing just the implementation, which is often just usability. Can customers figure out how to do this thing and ask questions probing on the solution, um, which can start a really productive conversation about value. It's, it's really hard to be passionate, be what Marty calls a missionary about solving a problem that you don't know exists or understands. So even extending that to, to the problem. So I'm specifically saying in those research sessions where you and everybody else thinks that you're just talking about usability, find places and ways, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about specific ways to do this, to ask about what the what problem this solution solves for them and how well it does that. And just two small but important points. One is um, if you are a product manager doing the research, I just wanna throw out there, try not to be so awesome. Like no Superman or women in the research sessions. And specifically what I mean is that product managers are genuinely almost always charismatic, great communicators, great evangelists for ideas. And the reason that's true is because they're not the boss of anybody. So they have to be persuasive in order to be successful product managers. But if you take that uh, successful product manager hat, great evangelist, charismatic persuader hat into a research session, then you're going to find out that you are in fact charismatic and persuasive, but you're probably not going to learn that much about the product. In fact, you might learn wrong things, which is even worse than doing no research at all, I would argue. So it's a small but important point. I actually have like a whole workshop talking to product managers about how to not be Superman or super, Superwoman in the research sessions. And then the other point is just to get the stakeholder into those interviews and not just one interview. Most people have seen this happen where you get like a really important stakeholder in, they watch one session and then forever after that person is the only person that they can think or talk about when they're thinking or talking about customers. So it needs to be multiple, but hopefully they're watching the session and they're learning about the people and they're learning about the problems that um, these people have and whether or not these solutions work rather than just learning about whether the implementation is effective or not. You could do video compilations or stories. Don't do reports. Even your mom doesn't read reports, right? Um, but this is, this is where we can start to move the needle where the stakeholder starts to get interested as well in the problem that we're solving. And then we get to collaborate and work together on that. So now you have the third method. You have working uh, bottom up, top down, and now outside in. So just to wrap up, um, your company and its processes might be a big ship to turn. And um, these are small things, but it might make sense to apply pressure in small ways across many areas because by building support and understanding across multiple levels while simultaneously driving collaboration and understanding um, and always building the, an understanding of customer needs and outcomes that we're seeking. I have seen feature teams employ these techniques to turn the ship relatively quickly. Um, some teams can make really substantial progress towards a new way of working in, in just a quarter or two. And ultimately, right, this is all with the goal of, of better outcomes. We're improving the product, yes, but we're improving team morale because they feel like they're doing work that matters. Folks are enjoying their jobs more. There's more personal satisfaction than, than just taking an order. Um, even for people who wait tables, that collaboration, like, do you have any allergies? How hungry are you? What kinds of things you like can be a lot more fulfilling than just, just taking an order. Um, and of course, 
this all adds up to a better business outcome as well. So there's a rising tide and all the boats are, are going up with it. Um, I would love to hear how it goes if folks try any or all of these tactics. Um, and I would love to, to help or, or share advice or listen to feedback from, from anybody about any of these. I, uh, my friend Jeff Patton says we're, we're all in our own ways working to make the world a better place by trying to create better outcomes for ourselves and for our customers. And I feel honored to come to product camp and speak with y'all and have a chance to contribute to that. Um, with much gratitude for the folks that contributed to this talk and um, help me put it together. So that's what I have. And I see we have three minutes, so I'm feeling pretty excited about the timing too. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. And it, it, it's perfect timing. And uh, the speech was uh, uh, very vital, I think, because uh, the uh, way we communicate with clients, it's uh, always uh, uh, the vital part for any product and uh, uh, so that we, we need to, to understand it, how, how it works. And uh, uh, what do you think, the, what's the best way for uh, the small company, what to start with, uh, with uh, to find the proper designer, a designer mm -hmm. or maybe to research the market or what? What do you think the best way? Yeah, I... Uh... I'm a fan of working with a consultant. It doesn't have to be us, but um, if you bring in a design consultant, they can start to get going on whatever projects you're working on mm -hmm. and they can help you find designers. So they don't need to be recruiters to say like, well, I'll, well I'm going to post, I'm going to review your job posting and make sure it makes sense. I'm going to help you by posting it in the places where designers hang out. I'm going to review portfolios or even be part of the interview team. And also if you do that, then the designer that you're trying to hire um, sees that you actually care about design and you're investing in design. They don't really want to be just like no engineer would want to be like the only engineer on your team and think mm -hmm. that you don't care and you're not investing. Like they see, okay, they care about design, they're investing in design and that's really powerful once you bring that person on and you put them together with your consultant and they're learning from each other. The person that you hire understands the work and why decisions were made. And, and then when the consultant goes away, they become a, a better steward for that work going forward. So mm -hmm. I really like that kind of both and technique where you're using an outside consultant or consultancy to bring somebody in and then have them work together. And then you have that core competency going forward. 